Welcome to Full Spectrum Science Shorts. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Today, Earth's Greatest Hits. We're going to explore the stuff in outer space that makes Earth its target. Meteors, meteorites, comets, and asteroids, and the spectacular and sometimes frightening shows they put on. When we look up in the sky, especially in a dark place, away from city lights, we see occasional streaks of light cross the sky in the form of meteors. Some people call these shooting stars, but they're not really stars at all. These are very small particles, maybe the size of a grain of sand or a pea, entering our atmosphere miles up above our heads. They come in at such high speeds that not only do they burn up during entry, but they also ionize the air they pass through, causing it to glow like a neon sign, leaving a bright trail visible from the ground. This is an actual video set up at an observatory to collect and catalog the direction and speed of these meteors. With this data, astronomers can calculate their orbits and gain some understanding of their origins. Sometimes during the year, we experience meteor showers when the Earth runs into material left over from the passage of a comet or an asteroid. These meteors seem to come from a certain constellation in the sky, and the name of the shower takes its name from that constellation. This is just a perspective effect for us on Earth. If you take a long exposure photograph during a meteor shower, like you see in this photo, this becomes more obvious. These are the Geminid meteors, as seen over Chile. These are the major meteor showers that put on the best displays during the year. There are many more showers, but with far fewer meteors per hour. Sometimes, something bigger than a grain of sand or a pea might enter the atmosphere, say the size of a baseball or a soccer ball, producing something like the bright green trail you see near the center of this photo. These larger objects will create a very bright streak in the sky and would be visible even from large cities. Some of these may even survive their dramatic plunge through the atmosphere and land on the ground. We catch more of these on camera nowadays because of the prevalence of dash cams in cars and trucks. Just to get some terminology under our belts, before one of these objects hits the atmosphere, before we can see it, the object's called a meteoroid. The streak of light we see in the sky is a meteor, or if it's especially large and bright, it might be called a fireball or a bolide. And again, if the meteor is big enough to survive its passage through the Earth's atmosphere, the thing you can pick up after it lands is called a meteorite. These are not rare events. It's estimated that 48 and a half tons of meteoric material fall on Earth every day. Of course, since the Earth is 71% covered by water, most of this material falls in the oceans. There can be several sources for these flashes in the sky. Some meteors are cast off material from comets. Here, you see Comet Swan, visible in our skies as this presentation was made in May 2020. This meteoric material is most likely a mixture of ice and dust. Comets are responsible for most of the meteor showers we see. We see these showers when the Earth passes through the debris left behind in the orbits of these comets. For instance, the Leonids, seen in November, are the result of the Earth running through the cast-off remnants of Comet Temple Tuttle. Notice how the average orbit of these particles intersects the Earth's orbit, seen in turquoise here. You can play with many of these visualizations on the website meteorshowers.org. Another source are asteroids. The asteroids are the leftovers of the solar system. Most of them orbit between the orbit of Jupiter and the orbit of Mars. Sometimes they're disturbed into new orbits that may intersect with the orbit of the Earth. These asteroidal meteors are not icy slush balls like the cometary debris. They're solid rocks, and they make up 99.8% of meteors that reach the ground as meteorites. Here, you see a dynamic model of the asteroid belt. And I encourage you to visit this website and play as well. 
What about those asteroids? What does an asteroid look like? This is a close-up, high-resolution photograph of the asteroid Bennu, collected by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft from a range of only 15 miles. Bennu has an average diameter of 1,610 feet. And, believe it or not, it has a 1 in 2,700 chance of impacting the Earth between the years 2175 and 2199, so nothing to worry about right now. More currently, asteroid 1998 OR2 passed within 3.9 million miles of Earth, that's only 16 times the distance to the Moon, on April 29th, 2020. It's that small dot in the center of the screen that's moving against the background stars. 1998 OR2 is between 1.1 and 2.5 miles in diameter, and it's moving at 19,000 miles per hour. The last source of meteors are those blasted from the surface of the Moon and Mars by meteor strikes on their surfaces. This is a nice movie of a meteor strike on the Moon, taken during a lunar eclipse by our friends at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Watch carefully, it's quick. Material from these strikes can be splashed into orbit and eventually land on Earth. Now, the chemical makeup of these, are, uh, of these rare meteorites can determine their origin. And I just happen to have a couple of them here. Let's take a look at them. Right here, I have, under this magnifying glass, a meteor that was splashed from the Moon's surface on the Earth. Now, to see this, I'm going to have to use a flashlight to light it up for you. But let me light it up and bring it close to the lens here. And there you can see, underneath the glass there, you can see that meteorite. And that's a piece of the moon. And you can actually touch it. Pretty cool that you can actually touch a piece of the moon. And these landed on the surface of the Earth. I also have one from Mars. So let's take a look at the Martian meteorite as well. Same setup here. Again, this Martian meteorite is underneath the glass, underneath the magnifying glass. And let's see if we can get a nice close-up of that as well. There we go. A little too much light there, huh? Yeah, there we go. Now you can see that Martian meteorite. Very cool. Well, let's get back to the slides here. Of the solid meteorites that strike the Earth, like this one here, there are basically two types, and I'm really oversimplifying this. <clears throat> Some are solid alloys of iron and nickel, uh, and this, what you're seeing here, is a slice of one such meteor. You can see that the surface here has been acid etch, revealing the crystal structure inside the meteorite. This crystal structure, these patterns are called Widmanstaten patterns, and they're unique to meteorites. You do not see this crystalline structure anywhere else. Other meteorites are made out of stone. They're stony in nature, like this sample. Although these are actually far more common uh, as far as meteorites go, they're harder to distinguish once they reach the ground. They kind of just look like plain rocks. The nickel iron meteorites are instantly recognizable since they're made of metal, and if you kick them, it hurts. Finally, there are combinations of both of these types of uh, meteorites, like this uh, beautiful sample of a stony iron palisite. These samples are housed at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, who provided them to me for these photographs. And I just happen to have a small meteorite right here as well. Let's, I'll take a look at it. Look at Here's a small meteorite. Again, this is a metallic stony, stony meteorite. It's not a stony meteorite. It's a metallic nickel iron meteorite. Sorry. You can tell that it's a nickel iron meteorite uh, because here's a magnet, and you'll notice that it is attracted. So that's kind of a cool thing. So there's a very small sample of a meteorite, and you can actually purchase some of these things if you go online. Most meteorites today are collected in an unlikely place, Antarctica. Ralph Harvey of Case Western Reserve University leads yearly expeditions to the bottom of the world to pick up these meteorites from the ice fields of that continent. What better place to find meteorites than on barren ice fields? They stick out like sore thumbs. The program is called ANSMET 
for the Antarctic Search for Meteorites. And as you can see here, ANSMET has absolutely the best patch. It was the best one I collected of all the ones I got in Antarctica. Now, I interviewed Dr. Harvey at McMurdo Station in Antarctica, and you can hear this interview on the Exploratorium's website at the URL below at the bottom there. Um, before the ANSMET program began in 1976, the world's collection of meteorites numbered perhaps 1,800 to 2,000. That's a pretty limited sample of the entire solar system. But in the past 35 years, ANSMET has returned nearly 20,000 meteorites from Antarctica. What really keeps some people up at night, literally, is the possibility that something much larger may someday hit the Earth. While large object encounters are relatively rare, it's happened many times before, and there's a lot of evidence for us to see. One of the largest asteroid collisions that we know of occurred about 66 million years ago. At that time, an asteroid with a diameter of 7 to 50 miles in diameter struck the Earth on the northern coast of the Yucatan Peninsula at a speed of 12 miles per second. That's almost 45,000 miles per hour. Called the Chicxulub impact, it created a crater 93 miles in diameter. Unfortunately, because the Earth is a dynamic place, weathering has completely removed the surface features of that crater, so we don't see any evidence of it today. But by taking careful, delicate gravitational measurements, instruments have revealed the hidden crater as seen in this overlay. This was the collision that caused the massive extinction of the dinosaurs and up to three quarters of all animal and plant species at that time. A little more recently, only 50,000 years ago, a 160-foot diameter asteroid struck the Earth near Winslow, Arizona at 29,000 miles per hour. It excavated a crater almost 4,000 feet across and 560 feet deep. This is the Barringer Meteor Crater, and you can go and visit this one. Since the asteroid landed in the high desert, it's suffered very little erosion in the past 50, er, 50 years. In the late last century, on June 30th, 1908, in the Tunguska area of Siberia, where you see the marker right there, the red marker, an object 120 feet across exploded in the atmosphere. It flattened 80 million trees over uh, 770 square miles of forest. It's the largest impact event in recorded history. The Tunguska event did not leave a crater. It's believed that the object exploded in the air, and it may have been a cometary fragment. You can still see evidence of the massive blast today, over 100 years later. Lastly, on February 15, 2013, a small asteroid fragment streaked through the morning skies of Chelyabinsk, Russia, Believed to be only 55 feet in diameter, this object broke up in the air before landing, turning the dark morning into noon. Again, dash cams allowed us to catch many, many photographs of this meteor as it passed. The damage caused by the Chelyabinsk meteor was not from any meteorite that fell to Earth. Only small fragments were recovered but rather from the massive shock wave created when the meteor passed through the atmosphere. This shock wave broke windows over a large area and even collapsed a few weakly built brick buildings. 1,600 people were injured, mostly by flying and broken glass. This small meteor released an amount of energy equivalent to 470 kilotons of TNT, over 31 times the energy release of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. But this meteorite was much higher up, and its energy was dissipated over a much larger area on the ground. But as you can see, the meteor doesn't have to hit us to wreak widespread damage. You'll see doors and windows just blown in here. Very dramatic. Here's a nice visual comparing the Tunguska meteor, labeled TM, and the Chelyabinsk meteor, labeled CM, 
compared to both the Eiffel Tower and the Empire State Building. I want to give you a few resources for you to explore on your own. The American Meteor Society has many wonderful things to explore on its website. This is actually a really great website to find out about upcoming meteor showers and how to observe them. If you're interested in craters and visible scars left behind by historical strikes to the Earth, you might want to check out the Earth Impact Database, maintained by the Planetary and Space Science Center at the University of New Brunswick. With the locations provided by this database and a bit of fiddling with Google Earth, you can explore impacts all over the globe. Finally, there are thought to be about 1,000 near-Earth objects that are larger than one kilometer in diameter, and there's roughly 15,000 larger than 140 meters. NASA has programs like the Center for Near-Earth Object Studies to discover and track near-Earth objects. I encourage you to visit their website if you're interested in news concerning our occasional near encounters with these objects. Even though we're busy detecting, cataloging, and tracking these objects, at this time we have no way to prevent a major meteor strike. A number of different scenarios are under active research and discussion concerning how we would deflect such an object. This, of course, depends on how large the object is, how fast it's traveling, and how early we detect it, among other factors. Here's one proposed method. Maneuver a large space mirror to focus sunlight on one side of the asteroid. The evaporated material provides a small thrust that will hopefully slightly deflect the asteroid into missing the Earth. With some clever engineering, we'll come up with an effective way to protect our home from these objects. I know I'll sleep better at night. This has been Full Spectrum Science Shorts with Ron Hipschman, brought to you by the Exploratorium in San Francisco.